Hello, everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, thanks so much for the invitation. This is a this is an absolutely uh, lovely place and a very interesting lineup of speakers and a vibrant community. So I'm, uh, I'm very thankful to be here. Um, so uh, my collaborators and I are, are essentially interested in large systems of social interactions. That uh, primarily means um, uh, social networks. Um, so we work on things like, for example, aligning social networks from different, different domains, sort of figuring out who is who um, in, in different social networks if the, the node labels themselves don't give that away. Uh, so social interactions is a, you know, one of the most important um, uh, measures of, of, uh, uh, of, of what happens in a, in a society, say. Then also another uh, very important uh, uh, piece of information about people is their mobility. That says a lot about you, um, who you are, what your preferences are, who you interact with and so on. So we work on that as well. We work on things like mobility prediction, where is a person going next? Or given a trajectory, sort of finding out um, which were actually the intermediate destinations that someone wanted to go to and which ones were just, uh, you know, pass-through points, uh, or uh, also thinking about privacy problems that are, of course, uh, very important here. Then you work on other things like epidemics, crowdsourcing, and so on. But it's just to give the, the high-level picture. Uh, then, of course, one of the most important um, and complex social interactions uh, we have in a society is, is essentially the political decision-making process, right? Um, how to get to agreements and decisions that affect uh, everybody. And so this is actually um, uh, sort of a very, very interesting and, and important system to study. And over the past couple of years, uh, many, many governments, at least in uh, uh, sort of uh, Liberal, liberal democracies have moved to you know, open government initiatives and try to publish a lot of, a lot of data. And so you know, this, this stuff is uh, becoming digital and moving online, and so we can, we can ask interesting questions about it. Um, so this is going to be, the, my talk is going to be a little bit of a shift of gears uh, from the previous talks. I'm not really going to talk about architectures uh, or, or cloud computing very much. Uh, and I'm also not really going to introduce many new methods. It's really an application of machine learning and data mining tools to a completely new data set that has never been looked at before. Um, and so you should sort of view it as a case study of uh, you know, the kinds of questions you can ask about political, political data and uh, you know, sort of how these how these methods that we're going to hear, hear about more, um, uh, I think mostly tomorrow, um, you know, how they can be how they can be used. And I'm going to uh, uh, assume that you're all intimately familiar with uh, the political system of Switzerland. Yes. <laughs> Do we actually have any Swiss here today? In yeah. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, so there's a couple of um, there's a couple of idiosyncrasies in in <laughs> yeah <laughs> cows and mountains right uh, I couldn't get chocolate in there but uh, um, so there's there's a couple uh, I mean the Swiss political system resembles many other European countries uh, and the U S in many respects and then there's some some idiosyncrasies that are are peculiar. Um, one thing that is, uh, uh, you know, for example, very different from the U.S. is that there's a very diverse, diversified party landscape. There's actually no inbuilt um, incentive for parties to sort of form grand coalitions. And so there's at least seven uh, major parties that, you know, sort of get talked about all the time and take positions, etc. Uh, we also have four official languages in the country, so uh, that's hard to make work. Uh, and it only works thanks to the very strong um, uh, federalism. And another interesting feature is that since 2003, there's a tool called SmartVote. 
an online tool that I'm going to talk about more uh, available where essentially voters can go and sort of get recommendations about who they should vote for, which politicians, candidates for parliament uh, kind of agree with their beliefs and, and um, ideology. And then another feature is that uh, Switzerland has a very strong sort of uh, direct democracy component in its political process. So um, uh, we actually vote on issues, you know, roughly 10 to 15 times a year. So there's like four Sundays uh, a year where, um, you know, laws that were essentially proposed by citizens um, and collected a certain number of signatures are then voted on. And so, you know, that data is all, of course, uh, available as well. Uh, and so, and so that's, that's interesting to analyze. Uh, so, so uh, just to, um, you know, give an example of this direct democracy aspect, um, I heard actually that this got quite a bit of coverage in Sweden, so we, we voted last year whether to buy new fighter planes. Um, Sweden. Sorry? From Sweden. From Sweden, yes, exactly, <laughs> so that's why I... So who, who was aware of this? I mean, oh, oh yeah, okay, okay, so this did, did get coverage here. Uh, and so, you know, the country was plastered uh, with, with posters for the yes and the no camp for a long time and it gets debated and, and then in the, end, uh, in the end we vote and as you probably know, um, uh, we decided not to buy the Gripen um, uh, and now we sort of sit completely unprotected in the middle of very menacing neighbors like, like Liechtenstein, for example. <laughs> and, uh, We'll just have to deal with it. Um, so, okay, let me let me jump right in and first tell you about the data sources that we uh, we uh, mined for this project. Uh, so, there's essentially three components in this project. The first, the first is Smart Vote. So, in Smart Vote, um, as a citizen, as a voter, you go in and you answer a certain number of questions, uh, some of them ideological, some very practical, about you know, what you think should happen. Uh, and, and then the politicians, candidates for the, uh, the equivalent of the House of Representatives, um, there's been about 3,000 of them, they do the same thing, they answer the same questions. Uh, and actually, uh, this, this you know, surprisingly, uh, there was very high participation in the last election uh, among politicians. About more than 80% of candidates actually used the tool. And so as a citizen, you go in and you answer the questions and then you can see who are the politicians, who are, who are the candidates who align with you the best in terms of these questions. And um, Smart Vote actually came out of a sort of a national research project and they were willing to share all the data, anonymized of course for the citizens, but uh, for the politicians we know who it is, uh, this is public, uh, they shared that data with us. Second one is uh, votes in parliament, so people who actually got elected in the last parliamentary election in 2011, they have voted about uh, uh, 2,500, actually more, more now, uh, the data is a little bit uh, uh, dated already, we need to update, but um, uh, so we have their voting behavior on all the bills that uh, uh, were discussed in, in uh, Parliament uh, so far. And then we have for the federal initiatives, so that's the dem direct democracy uh, issue, so for every of the 245 votes since 1981, uh, we have the yes-no proportion for every municipality, there's about uh, uh, 2,400 in Switzerland, um, uh, we, we have this, uh, this proportion for every vote. 1981, because before that, um, before that actually uh, the information is only uh, available at Canton, so state resolution, which is not fine enough for our, for our purposes. Okay, um, so one important thing we do with this data is dimensionality reduction. Very often when you look at new data sets, the first thing you want to do is sort of look at it and understand it. 
Um, and given that the data is often very high dimensional, as we just heard in the last talk also, you need to somehow make it, you know, bring the dimension down so you can look at it. And, um, you know, very, uh, very obvious questions you might want to study with, with these kinds of techniques is, what is the relationship between the consumption of chocolate and the production of Nobel Prizes? Right? It's a very natural question that uh, many of us have uh, thought about. And there was this article in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, uh, a couple of years ago, which, which actually uh, uh, maps this out. And um, there's a couple of very important um, insights here. Uh, for example, the, the Swedes are very, very good at, uh, you know, are at turning chocolate into, into Nobel Prizes. So, um, and all this delicious chocolate is, is wasted on the Germans. <laughs> so, um, so, um, but, but yes, yes, but uh, maybe we maybe we eat too much chocolate to. <laughs> yeah. Um, the important thing here is that you visually immediately see a pattern, right? Something that looks vaguely linear, and that's called a principal direction or principal component. When in your data you see lower dimensional structure, and that's what you what you what you very happy about when you, when you find it. It tells you something about, about your data. And this is easy in, with two-dimensional data like this. Our visual cortex can do the job. Now, um, it gets a little bit harder, so let's look at another example. Suppose we look at three-dimensional data that I project into two dimensions. And so here, it's maybe not immediately obvious what that is. Could be some kind of angel or something. Actually, it's, a, it's an elephant. But here it was difficult because we didn't look at this elephant in quite the, the right way. If I look at it like this, it is immediately clear what it is. And so here the principal component is this. And actually the principal component um, in approaches like PCA, and it, you know, for those of you who are already very, very familiar with the, these techniques, I, I apologize for this lengthy introduction. Um, so it's essentially the direction of projection that maximizes the, the variance in the projection. So essentially, you have points in high dimensional space and you sort of turn them and project them down, or you sort of walk around with a flashlight and you try to see the points as, mo as much spread out as possible. These, that's what techniques like PCA, uh, what PCA are doing. And so then often, um, you know, this principal direction uh, like we've seen in the previous example, tells you something interesting. And also, uh, often this is actually the best way, gives the best way of how you should project your data into lo lower dimensional space so that it makes sense to you. And so that's what we're going to do now with this political, with this political data. Um, so we've seen an example where we go from two to one dimension and then from three to two dimensions. Now, um, uh, of course, these things become much more important and interesting when the dimensionality is very high. So, concretely here, the smart vote data, uh, citizens and politicians answer 32 questions. So you can view um, every point, is a, uh, you can view every candidate as a point in a 32-dimensional space. In the municipality data, we view uh, a single point as one municipality and the proportion of yes, no, uh, over these 245 votes, plebiscites, uh, since 1981, would be the dimensions of the space. And then in parliament, it's 2,500 dimensional, um, where uh, a single point is one legislator, one politician, and um, their yes-no votes are the, are the dimensions. So here we can ask the same questions as with the elephant, which is what are the principal components and what does the data, um, what does the data look like when we project it down into you know, uh, two dimensions, for example. So let's look at, uh, at the smart vote data first. So here's what the website looks like. So there's, uh, here are these questions. Sorry, I have to switch languages from time to time. 
Uh, but basically, this, these are the, uh, uh, questions, 30, 32 questions, where with which you can strongly or weakly agree, or strongly or weakly disagree, or be neutral, neutral about. Um, and it's questions like, uh, you know, um, should Switzerland uh, try to join the European Union, um, or should we increase or decrease the public transportation budget? So this, this kinds of, uh, these kinds of questions. Um, and as I said, so there's a very high um, uh, uh, coverage of the of the actual politicians, but uh, about 10% of of citizens actually using this tool. So there, there it's uh, still relatively sparse. Um, so, so basically, we can just represent all this data. Um, when we now, now we focus on the politicians. Uh, okay, so we we can represent this as a matrix. So. Um, we have C candidates here. A row is is a single uh, candidate for parliament, and uh, the columns are the questions. Okay. And now, um, when you want to do dimensionality reduction uh, for a matrix, you take a singular value decomposition. So you try to actually um, approximate, uh, approximate this matrix as a orthogonal matrix times a diagonal matrix times an orthogonal matrix, where um, the, the, first, um, um, the first matrix will uh, contains as columns sort of the, uh, a basis for in, in candidate space, if you, if you will. And where the, the rows of V transpose, the right uh, orthogonal matrix, um, contains basis vectors for, if you, we could call it the ideology space. So it's in the spa space within which the questions live. Okay? Um, and what we hope is that these singular values we need here sort of quickly go to zero. If that's the case, we found a much lower dimensional structure in this, in this matrix, and it will tell us something. Sorry? Yes. Mm -hmm. Just a question. How do you pre represent categorical data? So we just sort of map it to, um, you know, something between zero and one. We don't do anything special. Don't do any, yeah. There are many special. So, I mean, uh, there's five levels, right, uh, in the questions. So there's some resolution, but... So, uh, as I said, the green vectors here are a basis for the questions or the ideology space and now I take these and I project my matrix onto this uh, onto this question space and so uh, and and now we have two dimensions two dimensional data where you know here we still have candidates but here we only have two dimensions we've reduced the dimensionality of ideology and now we can plot all the candidates in this ideology space we have not interpreted what these questions mean in any way, shape, or form, right? It's purely dimensionality reduction of some abstract points in a high-dimensional space. And here's what, you, here's what you get. So here are, you know, these two uh, singular vectors, the, the two green vectors. And I've plotted all the, all the candidates um, with their party affiliations in different colors. Um, uh, in this ideolo ideology space. And, and actually, um, this matches uh, almost exactly what you would sort of uh, think of if you think of the classical left-right conservative liberal uh, spectrum. And actually, the, the smart vote people have you know, manually plotted this, and it looks almost the same uh, as here. So here's, for example, the uh, Socialist Party, uh, over here, uh, heavy overlap with the Green Party, um, and over here is sort of the you know a very conservative uh, uh, rightist uh, party that most European countries have you know uh, have this kind of parties that are on the rise, and here are the kind of more liberal um, sort of but uh, uh, parties, but fiscally conservative. Um, so. Although we have not interpreted the questions in any way, this seems to tease out the political spectrum uh, that we actually 
usually sort of think of, which indicates that this actually you know, makes, makes sense. This is reassuring. Um, another thing that you observe is that there's a lot of overlap actually between parties, right? I mean, uh, things don't sort of separate too much into, into distinct clusters. Uh, okay, so this is others, <laughs> because there's a lot of small parties because there is not, as I said, an incentive for them to. Yeah. So it's others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So we can actually look at this overlap a little bit more. So here I look at the, I look for every party at what is the median, so the center of mass of that party, and then um, how many. Uh, candidates for that party are actually closer to the center of mass of another party rather than their own party. Right? That's sort of a measure of, of overlap. And um, you know, we see that some parties, so this one, this one, and this one, these are thought of as the center parties. And they, in particular, overlap a lot with each other. Um, so these are the sort of the Christian uh, conservatives, and this is the um, this is a party that splintered from this extreme right party and became more moderate, and this is the sort of more liberal, economically liberal party, and then the socialists are a bit on one end of the spectrum, and then uh, UDC is is sort of the uh, the you know far right uh, uh, party. Um, and so, uh, you know, this, this immediately sort of gives you a picture of what the, what the ideological makeup is uh, of the parties and how they position, position themselves. Um, so then we can actually uh, look at the, um, the ideology space. So this was the candidates in the space, but I've not described what these what these directions are that we found, right? These green vectors. So now we can look at these green vectors. And what I do is I, uh, I take this vector, and this, so this vector is in question space, so I can, I can ask, you know, what are the strongest component of each uh, uh, of, of these green vectors? So this is the, the most important uh, of these vectors with the strongest singular value in the, uh, in the SVD. And I can look at these questions. Sorry, it's in French. I'll, I'll translate it very, uh, very um, briefly. So the uh, first question is about um, giving foreigners the right to vote. Um, should there be fiscal uh, competition between states, cantons within the country? Um, should the highest and lowest salary uh, within a company be at most 1 to 12? So to cap essentially CEO pay, and should there be a should there be a government um, uh, a government uh, health care uh, insurance rather than private? So these are sort of you can interpret this as questions of equality, right? So uh, competition versus uh, making things uh, more equal. Yes, so these are, if, if I take the first green vector, I can look at which are the components, each component is a question, which one are uh, the largest in magnitude. So, so this determines the first vector the, the, you know, the most. So here's the second green vector. Um, should the, the Swiss military um, uh, serve abroad in peacekeeping missions? Um, should there be an agricultural free trade treaty with the EU? Um, should, uh, should the uh, free movement of people accord with the EU uh, continue? And uh, should there be a free market for milk? <laughs> but so, <laughs> milk price is very heavily managed in Switzerland. Uh, milk is, you know, very expensive. And, uh, so it is a worry. But these are, uh, as you can tell, more question of essentially uh, economic liberty and globalization, right? So relationships to uh, uh, other countries and, and, and so on. So 
uh, liberty questions. And I can also look at the third axis. We, didn't, we only plotted in two axes, but I can look at the third axis. So this is about should euthanasia be legal? Should homosexual couples be allowed to adopt uh, uh, children? Um, should uh, um, um, medically assisted procreation be expanded and should drugs be legalized? So these are clearly very social, uh, social is, uh, issues. Uh, so, and, and ethical issues. And, uh, uh, you know, we could call this fraternité. So, you know, uh, in a sense, this reinforces the French liberté, égalité, fraternité dimension. That is exactly what dimensionality reduction uh, gives, you, gives you here. Yeah, so this, it really groups these questions into meaningful, meaningful clusters. Yeah. So is it that you just chose three because of this French equivalent, or the, the basically eigenvector, the, 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 the weights dropped. dropped a lot after the third? Uh, um, it becomes more fuzzy as you go further. I don't actually remember what we found for... No, the, the, the values don't... The it drops, yeah. Drops. But it, uh, it, there's, no, like, there's no like knee. It, it, it goes down smoothly. Um, but, you know, as you go further, it becomes more noisy, as you'd expect. Um, good. So, you know, um, we can identify a meaningful ideology space from this, uh, from this, from this data. Now, uh, so, so far we looked at politicians. Now we can also look at citizens. So, now we're back to two dimensions. First singular vector, second singular, singular vector. And we plot the candidates here. So it's essentially the point cloud that I showed you. I show you the density here. And here's the same about citizens. A dramatically different picture, right? Uh, which, which is a little bit shocking, perhaps. Um, and we, we, we were really puzzled about this and dug in, tried to understand this. And actually, um, interestingly, what, what, do you, what would you guess what, what happened here? Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's a very good point. That's certainly going on. But you see that here, right? You see here you get variance, you get noise. But this spike is really hard to explain, right? Mm -hmm. Yes? Could it just be politics? I mean, that you're supposed to be, you have to have a message? Yeah. So if you observe the don't very good. Yesterday. It's the Socialist Party. Uh, we actually found an, uh, uh, an earlier newspaper article that found out that the, the Socialist Party, when this tool became widespread, they gave instructions to their candidates, say, here's how you should answer the questions, more or less. And so that, uh, that pulled the Socialist Party into sort of a single Dirac pulse uh, in the ide ideological so this spectrum. Is the views of the citizen, this is the views of the candidate, right? Yes. And uh, like in a density. So if you had really one system with proportional voting, you should suppose get the same. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, but this is, but these are candidates, right? Yeah. These are candidates, not no, who's oh, actually. Yeah, not the result of the There's not the result. These are the these are the candidates. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. ah. And um, so I'm sure they're not going to do this again, right? Because it it looks bad, and it's actually not clear that this is a good thing to do. Because if you, if you cover less of the ideology space, you got, you're less likely to be recommended to many different people. So, um, and actually, that's a question we wanted to study further. Uh, so, so here's a thought experiment, right? So you're a, you're a crafty politician. Um, and you have this data available to you, suppose. So what would you do? Now, citizens come in, they answer questions in, in, in some way, so they fill this space somehow. Where would you like to be yourself? You probably like to be in a place in this space that is as empty as possible, where other competitors are as far away uh, as possible, right? You'd like to be here, for example. Because then you get traffic, right? I mean, uh, you, get, you get citizens who, uh, among whose list you will rank highly. And so we, asked, we actually asked the question, given that we had this data, is could this be done? I mean, could you craft a dream candidate 
who finds you know a nice chunk of space uh, where where uh, that person would get recommended more than others. Yeah. But isn't it that it has to be overlaid to the answers of the voters? Because it might be that nobody answers anything. I mean, there, there are no, no voters that exist in this situation. Yeah, yeah, so but of there? course. But uh, as you saw, the voters are relatively smooth. So you assume sort of a uniform but distribution of the... Yes, you, you want to have a hole in the space of other politicians where there's also uh, you know, a reasonable density of, of voters. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we did this experiment. So, so we, we, um, we crafted, we handcrafted a candidate, an opportunistic candidate, uh, and then recomputed the recommendation that the tool would give uh, for this candidate. And the, the, the result is actually kind of scary. <laughs> so the x-axis here is the rank. Where on the list, when the voter uh, gets a list of recomm recommendations in decreasing order of proximity, that's the rank. And uh, the mean median of real candidates is here. Uh, so, you know, most candidates um, are not going to be in the top 50 uh, for, most, uh, for most voters. Makes sense, right? But then already uh, among the real candidates, there is actually a huge variance. Some people are recommended to a lot of voters. I think they were just lucky of where they ended up in, in space, in the space. And here's our crafted candidate. And by the way, the y-axis here is number, uh, total number of um, uh, voters among about a bit more than 200,000. So this is about 50% of the users of the, of the tool. So um, let me just give the interpretation. And so in other words, our crafted candidate is in the top 50 list, which is the size of the list you get in the tool, for almost half the voters. So I mean, that, that person will be, you know, get a, a huge advantage over sort of your average uh, dumb candidate who didn't uh, play this game um, and you know that is a potential uh, potentially a big danger yeah has, has smart vote been uh, i mean uh, the green one is obviously a danger but the blue one is, is reality the blue one is reality yes so probably i mean based on this a lot of people probably got elected yeah yeah Yes, um, it, it may be. There is, no, there is no indication that you know, this was done deliberately, that there's manipulation going on. You do need the data uh, to, you know, to do this, um, but it certainly indicates that uh, you know, maybe they should have more sophisticated criteria, uh, some kind of normalization, that you know, every candidate overall gets the same exposure. I mean, basically, uh, uh, we need to go further with, with, with this and be careful about how we do this. Yeah? Uh, how credible is the program of the Green Candidate? Because if you agree with everybody, then you can't do anything. It is credible in the sense that there's a lot of people who agree with this person. Like a lot of politicians. So, in that sense, uh, it, it is credible, right? <laughs> okay, we didn't look into uh, into it in uh, uh, at that level. That's a good question. But yeah, it could be that maybe it's in a sense it's even scarier because I believe some candidates try to game the system not explicitly but implicitly. Like I mean, Obama would never say he's an atheist, for example, or, or something. Like yeah, yeah. That. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's really there's some kind of implicit thing in the system that uh, politicians probably do not answer truthfully in the first place. Yeah. I know and that's even here you present just a tool for them to mm -hmm. sell <laughs> two things. First, politicians do not answer, answer truthfully, and a recommended candidate might, I mean, the, 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 the voter one might not. We look to other attributes, yeah. other, maybe completely irrational uh, reason to check. I agree that. I agree that this game is, in a sense, something that goes on naturally in politics, but with much less sort of information available, hard information available to, you know... Uh, but, but Obama did that. I mean, they really, in the, in the, in, when they tried to get the sentiment of the voters in, in the two elections before. Mm -hmm. so that is, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what, I mean, surveys and so on are, are supposed to do, right? 
Yeah. Just, just one more point. I think what the Cote said was uh, relevant. You may have a lot of contradictory opinions in the Green candidate, you know, because you don't have any constraint based on station here. Does this contradict with this opinion? Does this contradict with this? Um, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a good point. That's an interesting point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> good. Now let's look at uh, what happens when these people actually get elected and go into parliament. So um, we can look at the same data. No, sorry. We can look at their voting record and sort of project it down in exactly the same way. So this is now not smart vote data. This is actual voting behavior of, uh, of uh, you know, representatives in, par in parliament. This is a really true behavior. This is a really true behavior. Yeah, That's, and, and one interesting thing is that it looks much more polarized, right, than when we, when we look at the smart vote, smart vote data. Things sort of get pulled apart. Um, probably much more kind of, you know, much more collusion, much more positioning of the different, the different parties. And you can also look at that by looking at the, uh, the variance of the, you know, first, second, third, and so on component when you do this projection. So this is citizens, that's the data, the relatively smooth data we saw. Um, you, so you see that um, the first component is about 23%, 8, 5. And then candidates in smart vote, we had already seen, are you know, more polarized. Uh, this is in part probably due to this spike by, by the socialists. And then also in parliament, much stronger variants, right? Um, so, so things in representative democracy, I mean, are in a sense more polarized than what um, you know, citizens, then the positions of the citizens in, in this ideo ideological space. But so in some sense, this, the third uh, uh, circle is extracted from different set of, sort of questions or the... Yes. So the, the, the so the assumption is that somehow um, you can, uh, that somehow there is low dimensional structure in both that kind of drives, that there is some kind of ideological space that drives both things. And I'm going to actually, uh, just now, going to connect these two, these two levels. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll, we'll go there. It's a very good question. Um, OK, so now, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how does this compare to sort of US roll call data, sort of nominative scores? Or sort of, so like how, 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 how much of the variance in the US can you explain just with left versus right? I have no idea. It's a good question. But I mean, there's been some work done on this, like, like this, this is, you know, this, this nominative score where, where they also rank politicians like on one dimension and I, I don't remember that they, they found that, that one dimension explains like, I, I think it was like 50 or 60 percent of the uh, of the voting behavior as well, just like one left versus right. Or something. I see, okay, 50 to 60 percent. I think, yeah, 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 we, we should do more comparisons here, we haven't done that yet. Um, Okay, so now when we look at politicians, we have, uh, we have very interesting data for a majority of the politicians who are in the House of Representatives. So we know what they said in smart vote bef while they were campaigning, and now we see how they're really voting, right? And these two spaces are very different. Uh, uh, one is 32 questions, the other one is 2,500 actual votes in Parliament. So how do we connect the two spaces, the two levels? So what we're going to do is that for every vote in parliament, so one vector V here is a vote in parliament, we're going to train um, a binary predictor, so uh, uh, using a standard logit classifier from the smart vote profile. So for every, um, for, you know, for this candidate here, for a particular vote in parliament, we try to uh, come up with a predictor of how that person is going to vote. And to train that predictor, we're going to use all the other, um, all the other uh, uh, members of parliament. So we're going to uh, use this as a training set to come up with a predictor for that particular candidate. Say, will you vote yes or no? And we're going to do this. Uh, we're going to do this for every individual, um, for every individual uh, member of parliament. We're going to come up with such a um, 
predictor. Okay? Um, and now if we can look for every vote in Parliament, for each one of these 2,500 votes, we're going to say, okay, is this a vote that is overall, over the whole Parliament, easy or hard to predict? Right? How correct are we over all the candidates? And, uh, and we can then plot the, uh, the performance overall votes. So this is essentially the CDF of overall votes of how accurate uh, we can be if for um, a given member of parliament we only have the smart vote profile, can we predict how that person is going to, uh, going to vote? And what, we, what you see is that for um, about 50% of the votes, so this the right 50%, the performance is 95% or higher. So about 50% of votes in parliament are very precisely predictable. For 95% of the parliamentarians, we know what they're going to say, just from their smart vote, uh, smart vote record. So now we're just going to focus on these votes. So the votes that overall in uh, parliament uh, are well predictable. And we throw away the others because essentially uh, there's not a good link between smart vote and the, the, the vote in parliament. And now, now we have uh, uh, these votes that worked well, and now we're going to project these votes down into that ideological space again. And now, so this, is, <laughs> this, uh, this figure is a little bit difficult to explain. You see a small, you see a line here for every politician, for every member of parliament. So this is one member of parliament, this is another member of parliament. This line connects two points. The two points are the projection of the smart vote profile into this space and then the projection of the vote behavior over these well predictable votes into the same space. So essentially, if you had a politician who beha behaved in one way on smart vote and then did something completely different uh, in Parliament, you would see a long line, right? This person might move from here to over there or something. And actually, we only see relatively short, short lines, which basically suggests that, you know, politicians actually seem to represent the, the positions they took when campaigning quite accurately. We were actually very disappointed when we first, <laughs> the very first, uh, plot we got here had some really long lines and we were like, oh yes, um, you know, and then it was a bug. <laughs> so, yeah, so this is, uh, this will be very interesting to do, uh, you know, in other, in other countries and, and sort of see, you know, what's, what's going on. Yes. No, but the prediction model is, you know, is a, is a particular vote good over the whole parliament. So if you had outliers that misbehaved, um, you, would, you would catch them, right? So uh, if you had one parliamentarian who, who basically uh, sort of suddenly switched parties and voted completely differently, then uh, the vote as a whole would still be well predictable, except for that one person. But then that one person would, would show up here as a... So, don't you think you could have discarded those uh, bad guys uh, in this first step when you... Since they were unpredictable... And you focus uh, only on these 90. Because you focus on half that were predictable with yeah. probability. And it could be that if I am... Say, if I use your tool, I become a green candidate. I don't care what your tool gives me. I just uh, enter this... Uh, this, uh, this, this, this data, I get elected, and then when I elected, I vote whatever. What, uh, uh, yes. Uh, so, and then you would discard me, right? So then, uh, no, no, no. Because if a particular vote, you know, vote X on day X, over the majority of parliamentarians is well predictable, then this is going to be included here. And if you complete, do something completely, you know, that looks inconsistent with the position you took in smart vote, then we're going to see it here. But would I be included? Because here? Yes. 
I wouldn't be predicted. All members of parliament are included here. It's just votes, uh, it's particular votes that are not included. Yeah, I think some are sort of very procedural, you know, they're not really, they're just, they're just not close. I mean, people have only answered 32 questions. That's not really exhaustive, right? So, so I think there's uh, kind of, you know, detailed votes in parliament that just cannot be predicted well from, from these. Uh... Okay, now finally, people votes. Um, so this is, uh, you know, the direct democracy where, where everybody votes on a specific issue, should we buy grippens or not, or, uh, or whatever. And um, we do again the same uh, projection. So a point here now is a municipality, not a person. Okay? And uh, the first thing you see here is sort of, you know, what looks like two distinct clouds. So those who have lived in Switzerland, uh, it's probably immediately clear what that, what that is. Röstigraben. Exactly. Here's the Röstigraben. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so here uh, are the, mostly the German speakers and here are the French speakers. <laughs> and uh, it's... So that's one interesting thing. The Italians are actually uh, in, the, in the Germanic camp. <laughs> So, uh, so that, that was a surprise to us. And uh, so the Rösti Graben, for those who don't know, it is translated as the, the hash brown ditch. The notion being that hash browns are being consumed in, in huge quantities in the Germanic part of Switzerland, while the French speakers, uh, you know, are influenced by French cuisine and uh, feast on, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> on foie gras and... Uh, what not? <laughs> so, uh, so basically, this this really shows uh, that this Rösti Graben actually does does exist, right? Uh, there is a, a sort of a clear, a, a pretty sharp separation. Uh, there's uh, there are a few uh, you know French uh, municipalities that are in this camp, but actually, if you look at it, these are really um, these are really towns that are close to the language border. So. Um, it's surprising that, you know, uh, this country exists and, and works. <laughs> and um, up here we find the, uh, the large uh, Germanic uh, and here the large French cities, L large for <laughs> Swiss, uh, at Swiss scale. And, um, and so the, the second dimension uh, one finds here uh, is, um, is sort of more the um, urban versus countryside uh, split. Uh, so how am I doing on time? Yeah, I think you're fine. You're fine. Yeah? Okay. So um, we actually have an online tool uh, called uh, uh, predicon.ch where you can sort of uh, uh, look at this data. Maybe I do, uh, I do, I'm going to do a very quick switch over. Um, so here's this tool and you can essentially uh, explore this data um, so you can look at, at particular votes. Let's look at the uh, Gripen vote. <laughs> Sorry, it's the wrong one. This is not the one. <laughs> so you have a, a bit of a screen size issue. Find it. Okay, Gripen fighter aircraft. And so here you see, um, you know, you, you see very clearly why it was rejected. It was the French-speaking peaceniks who uh, um, said mostly no, whereas the the Germanic warmongers uh, wanted the uh, <laughs> wanted the plane. So. Um, and uh, you know the the boundary you see here is is relatively close to the uh, to the aforementioned Rösti Graben. Um, 
there are other there are uh, you know there are other votes where there's much more agreement. Um, uh, one of very recent one I want to show you. I think the, fr the French party just wanted a Raf Raphael. <laughs> the Raphael, yeah, yeah, that's that's possible. <laughs> So here's a, here's a vote we had very recently uh, in the last um, voting Sunday uh, about introducing a national inheritance tax. Switzerland doesn't currently have a, a national inheritance tax. And uh, here everybody agrees we do not want <laughs> with taxes. <laughs> so. Uh, Yeah, it's kind of between 40 and 50%. It's rel relatively low because it happens so often that... Um, um, okay. What happened here? All right. Okay. So we can also then look at, um, again, these... these uh, dominant dimensions into which I've plotted uh, this, this vote result and sort of look at which specific votes were, you know, the most uh, determinant in this dimension. So which, which describes this dimension best. And, um, and you see that uh, the, first, the first dimension is dominated by uh, a vote which was probably one of the most important votes that happened in the last couple of decades. Um, uh, for Switzerland to join the European Economic Area, which was uh, rejected very narrowly and, uh, you know, uh, really split the country. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's, that's still kind of a dominant uh, dimension in, in um, when, when we look at uh, this, how this voting data is structured. The, the second component, so, and, and here you clearly see this uh, French uh, German-Italian split. Um, but there are other things. So, for example, here is, is one um, which is not at all a, a German-French uh, sort of split, but this is actually more of... Uh, so this is about popular initiative for the pro uh, protection of farms and against animal factories. So uh, also informally known as the Small Farmer Initiative. And so this is much more of a countryside versus urban uh, uh, split here. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, that, that helps to sort of interpret um, what's going on. Um, we can then, um, so essentially this two-dimensional grid that I show you, I can, I can uh, essentially have a color gradient that I overlay with these points and then I can actually color uh, every municipality with its position in this in this in this gradient, and uh, you see, you know that uh, that really um, there is a very sharp boundary, which is exactly the language boundary um, uh, where the color sort of changes. But you also, you see other things. Um, you see that the urban centers, uh, the German-speaking urban centers, look very different, and actually, interestingly, more kind of like Italian-speaking Switzerland. Um, uh, and the and the French uh, the French speaking urban centers have their own their own color, but are also distinct from kind of the French speaking countryside. And then uh, another interesting thing is that this area here has suffered sort of its own its own color. Uh, so this is um, this is a really you know mountain area, but French speaking and. Um, and they, they vote very differently. This is one canton here. They vote very differently from their uh, German-speaking brethren. Even though if you, if you drive through, you see hardly a, a, a difference. And they seem to sort of have a, a voting behavior which is distinct from everybody else. And uh, I'd actually, uh, you know, would, would like to declare, in, in addition to the, to the hash brown ditch, another barrier here, which you could call the raclette barrier. Uh, because raclette cheese comes from this area, this area here. Um, but so this really gives a geographic interpretation of um, sort of how people behave, how people uh, uh, vote, and kind of how influence, uh, you know, uh, maybe, maybe spreads. Um, because you see that, for example, the, the urban centers really shine around them and, and there's sort of a dilution effect. 
Uh, it's also possible to look at this data. So, so far, this is, you know, I, I looked at all the votes from 1981 to today um, and projected it down in a single shot. It's also possible to take shorter windows uh, and then look at how the projection evolves over, uh, over, over time. And so, uh, here I, I look at the window and sort of how it evolves over time. And you will see that this 1980, uh, 1992 vote, uh, so that's only the middle of this interval, that has really pulled the country apart. And that's very much recognized that this vote was, you know, there was such strong disagreement in the country. And, um, and for a while, the Italians were actually sort of in the, in the French camp. And now, more recently, it seems that the country is getting more uh, sort of integrated. I mean, things are, the Italians are moving back into the French camp, uh, but also there there's starts to be more overlap. So that's kind of, a, you know, uh, maybe a good message. Maybe the Rösti Graben is actually slowly getting filled. Yes? It's very difficult to interpret. I mean, um, uh, I, I mean, I, I think it's also um, that um, the country is becoming more open, very connected to Europe. I think also that the position with respect to Europe has become more unified between French and German speakers. Um, it used to be that the, the French-speaking French -speaking Switzerland essentially wanted to join the EU. Uh, and this was an anathema in, in German-speaking Switzerland, and I think these positions are sort of getting reconciled slowly. Um, and one last sort of uh, uh, anecdote, this was more a fun thing we did. We asked, if you look at a single municipality in Switzerland, how well could you predict how uh, votes, the vote outcome at the national level? So which is the most representative municipality in the country. And so this is sort of the distribution, and up here you have a town called Ebicon. Um, and it's interesting, if you look at this town, um, it's really in almost all respects you could look at, it's a very average town. It's kind of in the center of Switzerland. It's close to an urban center, but it's not in the, it's, you know, kind of suburbs. It has you know, the party landscape is very representative of the country as a whole. The uh, fraction of foreigners is about the, you know, average and so on. This is a, the most average town of Switzerland. <laughs> and this was just a fun thing we did and uh, had in the paper. And, uh, you know, the, the, the journalists were all over this. I mean, uh, that's, that's the thing uh, in, in this whole study that, that really got a lot of coverage. Um, and, and actually, the, the mayor of this town, so we were kind of saying Ebicon is a really the most average town in the country. The mayor of this town was extremely thrilled about this and called us up and wanted to do a press conference with <laughs> TV. And uh, so it's, uh, uh, and then, you know, uh, because it's got so much coverage, uh, and then it started to be misrepresented. So instead of saying, you know, this particular town is the best so to predict, they said they actually vote like the rest of the country. And then they started writing that, oh, you only need to poll. Why do polls in the whole country, right? I mean, <laughs> why, just, why just ask there? And then they started, <laughs> they started doing follow-up interviews with political scientists who said uh, these guys at the EPFL are idiots. Uh, of course, you cannot. Uh, <laughs> so never talk to journalists. So um, this was a, a fun episode. So what we're, what we're working on now, uh, very briefly, is uh, we're now trying to do a prediction uh, based on partial results. So what happens on a you know, Sunday when people vote is uh, every municipality counts and the results are sort of trickling in. And all the newspapers and TV and so on, uh, they report the current average yes and no uh, of what has been counted so far. Um, and... Um, uh, you know, often that goes wrong. It goes wrong for various reasons. For example, there are built-in biases. Uh, small communities, of course, are done counting earlier than others, and so in, in, early, uh, in early projections, they are overrepresented. And so, um, so we're trying to do better. And we, we essentially um, are working with models that uh, you may be familiar with from recommender systems, um, where we say that 
you know, a vote in municipality I and the, the nth vote um, is the result of uh, first um, a regression term which takes into account features of the municipality and of the actual thing being voted on. So, uh, so we learn two regression terms here, and I'm going to say what these features are in just a second, and then also a sort of a cross term. So, uh, so basically, uh, where again you sort of postulate in these matrix factorization models uh, a lower dimensional structure that you want to that you want to learn. Um, so, so uh, this would be fitted with, you know, ALS or whatever that was uh, alternative, uh, alternating least squares, as was um, uh, talked about in the previous talk. And uh, so, all the red stuff we need to learn it from from past from past data. And uh, so, what are the what are the features we can use for the regression terms? So, for the votes. We, again, we don't want to interpret, right? We could sort of look at, is this more like an agriculture vote or a freedom vote or a social vote? We don't want to do that. We want to just be data-driven. So uh, there's an additional piece of information we can use here, which is parties, the political parties, they all emit recommendations. Uh, they say the, to their adherents, you know, here's, you should vo vote yes, no, or we don't care. Um, and so we use that as a feature vector to kind of describe uh, what a vote uh, is about. And then munip municipality features, um, here, you know, there's a lot of information available. Size, population, density, elevation, and so on. You might, you might think uh, elevation is really unimportant. Actually, it's very important. <laughs> because all the urban centers are low and, uh, you know, and people who live at a high altitude, I think the lack of oxygen sometimes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, and, and, uh, so basically here you see when partial results come in, out of the 2,400 uh, uh, municipalities, when we have 5, 10, 15 and so on uh, that have, uh, have been counted, um, this is the, the running average you will get. This is what the newspapers, the, R, the RMSC, so this is the error. Um, mean square error. Um, this is what the newspapers currently report, and this is two versions of this uh, model that I that I just described. So we can actually kind of reduce the error by by about a factor of two early on, and and uh, you know sort of do better projections than um, what you get by just reporting a, an, an average of what people the votes counted so far would indicate. But that's terrible for me that you remove the thrill of. <laughs> well, these come in only once everybody has voted, right? There's no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> True. Good. Um, so that's uh, that's it. Um, so we have uh, to summarize. We have two goals in this kind of project. One is we. You know, do try to work on the methods like the predictive model that, just, that I just described. So, so try uh, essentially try to push the tools for data analysis uh, uh, further. You know, uh, better ways to see the elephant. Um, uh, but also, you know, I think this kind of study can potentially enrich, uh, you know, the workings of democracy uh, by giving a better understanding of what's going on. How how ideas uh, and opinions are, are, are created. Um, and here, so we're not political scientists. We don't know what we're doing here. Uh, so we try to interpret at the very end. So we, you know, we sort of, sorry? That is, uh, yeah. Um, so, so we essentially, we don't give any interpretation at the beginning what these questions are about, for example. We, we try to view this as a purely data mining uh, exercise, and then we try to interpret only the final, the final result. Uh, and I in, invite you to take a look at the tool, uh, if, you're, if you're interested in Swiss politics, uh, or if you know you'd like to maybe do something similar for your country of choice, we'd be very happy to talk to you and share information and uh, and, and tools. Um, and there's also um, a paper with a second one coming uh, coming soon 
on uh, some of these results and, and methods. And um, I'm done. Thank you very much. questions and then Anywhere we go for lunch. Anywhere. Yeah, uh, one question. Uh, could your tool uh, be used to help design uh, the, the question? So the reason I'm asking is so, so in the setting of uh, online dating, people have looked at, you know, okay, Cupid data where you fill out a bunch of questions and, you know, others fill out a bunch of questions and you see, do you end up in a relationship or not? Well, it's kind of like, are we, you know, are you a good part, a political partner for me, right? Sort of so. And some of the most distinguishing questions made sense, like, you know, related to religion or sort of so, but others were sort of surprising. And so here the questions I'm asking, could you come up with like a five question survey that gives you a better explanation power to mm. cover some more of the variants than, I don't know, 32, 42, you know, maybe what's your favorite color is more important than, I don't know, you know, how, I don't know. Something. Yeah. You probably need some, uh, you know, small test cohort, but, uh, but yes, that would be a great idea to see uh, if, for example, if you add some questions and have, you know, 100 people answer all the questions, including the new ones, does this significantly add information or are they heavily correlated with what we already know? Um, or also to filter down the questions, right? Maybe you only need to ask 15 questions rather than 32. And another application could be a dating service where you, uh, you know, you basically uh, uh, are introduced to people who have the same political beliefs as, your, as yourself. <laughs> uh, there was another. No, we didn't, and, and that's actually a great idea. That would be very interesting to look at. So, but we haven't. Well, I think I would like to ask you to take the questions offline because we still have to manage to catch our lunch before we, we come back. So let's thank Matthias again. Thanks. Thanks.